Hi everyone, um, we're the Composite Wheel team for Lunar Mobility. My name's Zach. Natalie. Jackie. Josh. Um, so just to uh, show us, show you guys our final result, here it is. We have a, a com completed uh, composite wheel for uh, Lunar um, Rover. Um, first, to go over our outline, we're gonna start by, I'm gonna mention, we're gonna mention the uh, design requirements we were faced with at the start of this project, uh, we're going to talk about uh, several of the designs we went through, our design processes, and finally the uh, final design we moved forward with. We're gonna we'll talk about uh, how we fabricate the molds and the composite parts from those molds, um, then how we assembled all of our final composite parts together to make the uh, final wheel, and uh, lastly, uh, our testing procedures and results from that showing that the uh, wheel will survive uh, under all loading conditions. So uh, for our design requirements, um, here they are. Uh, first of all, the sizing of the, of the wheel had to be uh, 24 inches in diameter. Um, it had to be six inches in width, which is uh, both those sizes are very, very large for a uh, rover. It's the largest wheels I think we produced here um, in Astrobotic. Uh, the mass had to be under three kilograms, which is uh, a pretty low mass requirement considering it has to support a 300 kilogram uh, rover and then uh, strength requirements we came up with um, four different loading conditions we have lateral loading which is under skid steer uh, rim pull uh, spoke loading and point loading and we'll go more into those a little later all right design of the wheel uh, so first we looked at previous wheels that people have used on the moon as well as on earth to kind of get the creative juices flowing uh, and we came up with a bunch of our own concepts uh, then, analyzing our own concepts, we put them into a weighted matrix uh, to analyze how they would perform based on their weight, um, how sturdy they would be, uh, how likely they are to be easy to manufacture, and all stuff like that. We came out with a final design. Final design has six spokes, uh, which are curved and tapered to maintain strength while reducing mass. It also has around 36 grousers, which are the treads, um, and that's used for traction. Uh, as well as maintaining and distributing loads. So from this, we made our mold. The mold is basically a negative of whatever part you want to make. And we're going to have three different molds. Uh, the bowl is for the spokes, which is the center part. Uh, the channeled one is for all of the grousers, uh, which we then will cut up. And then the round one that looks like a hat uh, is for the rim. This is a more detailed spoke design. Uh, again, we have the tapered spokes and there are six of them. We also have a large adhesion pouch uh, so that when we do place it into the rim, we have a large quantity of surface area that is connected to one another uh, to hopefully keep them from coming apart under loading. Uh, so we came up specifically with how the grouser should be. Um, there should be 36 of them. Uh, we ended up having them be four layers thick. Uh, so they have two Kevlar layers on the outside as well as two carbon layers within for strength. Uh, the Kevlar layers are there to retain its abrasion resistance uh, so that when it's going over regolith, it doesn't kind of degrade and crumble and come apart. So we did a thickness test before we actually made the whole wheel to determine those four layers uh, that we made. So we had multiple different layers. We did three layers as well as four layers and five layers. Uh, and with the testing rig that I just showed you, we came up with when they broke under what loading conditions. Uh, so while three layers was sufficient, we did end up going with four uh, to be safe for all of our loading conditions. So these are the three parts. They'll all kind of swish together uh, into the wheel that we passed around. Uh, based on the grouser pieces that we made, uh, we just kind of wanted to see how we were going to do with the mass analysis, uh, just based on a piece of carbon fiber and Kevlar with epoxy in it, uh, just because the mass seemed like really, really low to us. Um, intuitively speaking, uh, and we found out that actually we should come in under mass, which we did. And now well, I'm going to talk about the process of fabrication. First is about the mold. And we need to glue the bone blocks together and make the gaps between as small as possible. Then we machine it with new Simon robot arm. And then it's a long process about sanding, epoxy it, sanding, epoxy, and sand it to make sure it's smooth. 
And then we can clean and seal, seal the surface to make sure the separation between the parts and the mold. Then the mold is ready for layout. And about layout, first we need to cut the materials into strips and with certain size. Then cover it with epoxy resin. Then put it on the mold with uh, the pattern we want. Then we can bag it with pill ply, breather, vacuum bag, <coughs> then vacuum it, put it in the oven for eight hours to cure, and trim it for the certain size and pattern we want. Then after we have all the components ready, we can assemble them. First is the spokes, after the trim with the robot arm, and 36 grousers. And we lay up the grousers with, around the rim and glue all the parts together to get the wheel. So once we've put our wheel together and built it, we needed to test it, uh, our wheels to make sure they survived our loading conditions. Uh, we focused on strength testing um, for our basic loading. <laughs> um, the first one is the lateral loading, which is simulating the skid steering uh, we calculated the skid steer load to be 256 pounds on the side. Uh, here, we, here is a video of us loading it up. Uh, the second one is the rim pull, is when um, if all four wheels had rocks under them and they would climb over the rocks at the same time. Uh, it represents a tangential force on the, uh, on the rim of the wheel. Uh, we calculated it to be around 165 pounds. There is, there is me loading it. <laughs> uh, the next one is the spoke load. Um, this is uh, if the rover were to fall off uh, of a big rock and land on a single spoke. Uh, we calculated it to be around uh, 413 pounds uh, directly over the spokes. Um, we loaded it up, heard some cracking, so we stopped. Uh, Here's the point load, is kind of similar to the spoke load, except if it were to fall onto a pointy rock. Um, there was our pointy rock. It is a, uh, the head of a screw, and we, you can't see it very well, but we loaded it up similarly to how we did the spoke load, and um, there is the screw head underneath there. Um, we calculated uh, the pressure uh, on for the spoke Point load to be around 1,058 psi. Okay, so uh, just to make some concluding remarks about our uh, final product here, um, to go through our requirements again to see if we match those requirements. Uh, the size we uh, did match. It was the final wheel is 24 inches in diameter, six inches in width. The total mass actually came out to only being 2.166 kilograms, so that's a 28 percent reduction from our uh, specifications. So that was really a good result. Um, for our strength, as we said, we uh, loaded it under all four conditions, lateral load, rim pull, spoke load, and point load. Um, the three with check marks there are ones that definitely, uh, it satisfied the spoke loading. Um, as Josh mentioned, we did hear some, some cracking. What that was was just the inner uh, the spokes separating from the outer rim. It wasn't actually a, a failure of any parts, it was just that it was the, uh, the way we adhered the uh, spokes to the outer rim. So that really shouldn't be a major issue to, uh, to uh, fix. It's, we actually have some ideas of how we could better adhere those two parts together, basically by cutting the webbing that um, goes between the spokes and using the vacuum to press the two parts together. Uh, here's a, just the a last image of it on the, on the mass balance. And as you can see, it's 2,166 grams or 2.16 kilograms. Uh, so for future work on this project, um, first of all, as I just said, we, we have some ideas about how we can improve that adhesion between the spokes and the outer rim. Um, we need some new molds with uh, the high temperature foam. The foam we're using for our current molds actually was not rated for uh, the temperature 250 degrees that we were heating it at, causing it to actually shrink during the uh, vacuum and uh, heating process. Um, also we needed trim the spokes, uh, just find, find a better way to trim the spokes because right now we're getting some vibration with the uh, robot arm CNC which is causing, um, as you might have seen, some slight imperfections in the spokes but um, it's nothing too major. 
Uh, also, fabrication of a third and fourth wheel components after the uh, new foam comes in. Um, then obviously we want to actually attach this to the rover so we can get some field testing done and see how these uh, perform under real <coughs> world situations. So uh, thank you very much. Um, we, we'll take questions now. Yeah, sure. Um, we, on all, f all the three besides the one we talked about, the spoke load, we, we, uh, we basically just use people's body weight and slowly eased on their, their weight until they were entirely on. Some of them we actually had, if the person wasn't heavy enough, we had them hold uh, weights as well to get to that point. So we, we just basically didn't stop until the, the um, loading condition was met. Um, yeah, those were uh, just based on, you know, we had the mass of the rover, um, and then we took into account, we just, <coughs> just basically using free body diagram, figured out how much uh, force would be on each wheel in a, in a static case, just staying there. Then we added in dynamic forces, we basically just multiplied that by about uh, two and a half times and then added a factor of safety for any, basically that, that would be under a case where um, you know, the rover was to climb over a rock and then just fall and fall or fall into a small crater or something like that where you have some really high, four, yeah, 413 pound force would be a pretty bad scenario, but. I guess I'm really curious about the, um, the turning load that seems oh. high to me. Um, so, the so turning load was just calculated, it was the yeah. same thing. We, um, we actually modeled it with a, a rock pinning one of the wheels, so it is experiencing yeah, in that case, you basically have the uh, the entire rover trying to pivot about a, a, sing, a sing, single point, and it also assumes that you're having perfect traction on all all four wheels, which is un unlikely. But again, we wanted to take into account any possible situations. It's an amazing story in a lot of ways. Uh, could we play the movie while I ask my question? <laughs> yeah. The So the going in dimension is six inches and all parts of your wheel reinforce the other parts, meaning that uh, once it's monolithic, that the grousers reinforce the rim mm -hmm. and the rim reinforces the spoke. Now that you put it together, could you imagine Economizing the material even more—is uh, it just enough? Too much of a wheel, or uh, could it be economized in some way, uh, or should it be even uh, stronger or overbuilt from what it is? Uh, yeah, I think um, some of the things we've, we've been talking about were. Um, and the, the spokes may have been slightly overbuilt. We used 10 layers per spoke, uh, which actually ended up with a 30 layer um, for, for, the in, uh, for the hub. Um, that's probably a little more than was necessary. Um, we just did that, you know, for, to be safe. We could, I think in a future wheel, we might be able to reduce that maybe to eight layers, which it could, could save um, some mass there. Um, yeah, besides that, I think we pretty much uh, got got it just right on the uh, grouser uh, thickness and the and the rim, based on our our testing and just how it looked. So. And if it doubled in width from the six inches to twelve, would it double in mass? Or is there uh, some? Most of our weight came from the rim, so it would, it wouldn't necessarily double it, but it would more, it would, it would add it 
faster if you were in to increase the size <coughs> of the rim. And also, this, we may have to change the design for the spoke, because if it's too wide, then this kind of spokes may need some support or kind of. You know, yeah, but to answer your question directly, I, it wouldn't actually double it because um, oh, at, the majority of the mass is located on the rim, so in, and it, would, it could you know, get close to doubling, but then you would only have still a single uh, hub as we have here, which is also a major source of mass. We have that 30 layer where the hub attaches on, so you'd be able to cut, off, cut away on that. And uh, yeah, so in, in that sense, you'd, you'd be saving mass. And uh, if the width was just for soil pressure, maybe So there's a carousel in Robot City that mounts a wheel at the end of a boom and it uh, rolls uh, for hours on end. So you can throw whatever rocks you want in there. You could build little hills and it'll just kind of coast over all the, all the soil that you've put in there. You can run it for hours and see what happens. Yeah, no. For actual measurement of abrasion, I, I know I think a method used often is just you look at the change in mass of the wheel. So it shouldn't be changing mass, but if it is, that probably means you're, you're having some abrasion on the around it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.